JJ Walsh, your host in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I am joined by a uh, activist and repeat guest on this show, but this is the first time we're talking about her activism, trying to save trees and protect our very important parks in the Tokyo area this time. Thanks for joining, Rochelle. Well, thanks so much. Delighted to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you. So we've had you on the show a few times talking about intercultural business relationships. That's your main Perfect. job, right? Right. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did this passion start for saving the trees? And you call yourself a tree hugger. When did this yes. start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been interested in trees and greenery you know, for a long time. I'm a big hiker and I love to spend time outdoors and just, you know, like trees and greenery. I think they're wonderful. And I have been involved in a couple um, things in the United States and places where I've lived, like Chicago and Silicon Valley, um, dealing with developments that endanger trees and endanger communities. So I have done some of this kind of thing in the past as well. Yeah, so important. Um, not only, I think, especially because of your business role, to also have that activism part of your sustainability mindset. I think you are the new breed of the entrepreneur that we hope to see more of in the business community. So thanks for everything you're doing. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's become just this um, interesting additional activity in my life, so. Yeah. Well, let's uh, just mention that you started a campaign last year. Did you move from Fukuoka last year and yeah. you got involved with the Yoyogi project? Right. I moved from Fukuoka um, last spring. So, you know, I've been up here in Tokyo. You know, I've been hanging out in Tokyo a lot in the past, but, you know, I have been in Fukuoka for a while. So I, I got here to Tokyo pretty soon after I was here in Tokyo. It was the lead up to the Olympics. And I'm a big Twitter user, and I've seen on Japanese Twitter that there was a plan to have public viewing events in Yoyogi and several other parks. And in connection with Yoyogi, there were signs around the park saying that they were going to cut all the branches off the trees below, um, I forgot what it was, but a certain height, I want to say five meters or something like that, that's pretty um, actually low for, for chopping off branches. And it just sounded like a terrible idea to be disfiguring trees for a one-time event. And also, this was the middle of the pandemic. And why build a public viewing area that is designed to gather thousands of people in the middle of a pandemic? It absolutely made no sense at all. And so I thought, this sounds like a bad idea. And since I do a lot of social media, maybe I can help get word out about this thing that just doesn't really sound wise. And and initially, I thought, well, how many people are really going to care about, you know, cutting some tree branches and, and having this, you know, crazy event in a park? And I ended up with, um, I forgot what the number was, but it was about 150,000 signatures, this huge number of people. Um, I'm, I'm showing it right now, 153,000. Yes. 258. Yes. That's Thank amazing. You. Yeah. So people were really worked up about this topic. They were very upset, um, you know, one about the trees, two about building this unnecessary thing in the middle of a pandemic when there weren't ever going to any going to be any visitors coming to Tokyo and we really shouldn't have had anyone moving around. So people were, were not happy about it. So got a lot of support and um, was able to persuade the Tokyo government to do two things. Um, in the middle of the campaign, they um, started the tree trimming and actually a Japanese reporter who was on the scene got someone from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government to admit that they were being um, much more, um, you know, holding, holding back on the tree trimming and doing as little as possible because of all the public attention and pressure. So we couldn't stop them from cutting some branches, but it was less than they had originally planned. And the second thing that happened is, is that they canceled the plan to use the facility as a public viewing site. They ended up building it anyways and using it as a vaccination center. 
which um, we can debate the, the how much sense that made. But anyways, that's what they did with us. But you made a lot of progress. Just I think you and the other campaigners who were raising awareness and raising voices against uh, what they were planning to do. And I remember that when they were they were going to have a viewing facility. So right. cut down loads of trees, have a viewing facility for the Olympics, but everybody would be watching it at home anyway. There wasn't a need. And this is something you've said a few times. A lot of these plans were made before the pandemic, exactly. before nobody was going to be allowed in the stadium. So it just, there was this contradiction with the reality that we were facing. Right. right? And that's, um, we'll talk about it in a minute, but that's a similar thing with the Jinghu Gaiyan project that I'm protesting now, that it was created before the um, pandemic happened and has not been revised to take into account the fact that the world has changed, right? You know, in the case of Yoyogi Park and the public viewing, I'm told by people who um, were into the Rugby World Cup that was held in 2019 that they had some public viewing um, areas like this, and that in the time for the rugby that they were lots of fun, right? Um, if you're you're there with a bunch of people, you're watching it on a big screen. You know, if you can't get into the stadium, this is another nice venue. It's kind of fun, so it's not like it's always a terrible thing to do, but just not at that time. And then also disfiguring trees for it is all, was also kind of a problem with it, right? I'm showing pictures now of Yu Yogi Park for people who don't know. Um, whenever, I don't visit Tokyo often, but whenever I go to Tokyo, it's one of the places that I, I'm just so grateful for so much beautiful nature right in the center of the city. It's like New York's um, Central Park, right? It is right? very much, like, yes, in terms of scale. It's beautiful. It's large and beautiful, yes. And everybody, uh, very similar to the project that you're working on now, it's something that people who visit Japan, people that move to Tokyo, always talk about as an asset of the city, right? Right, right. exactly. And it just seems insane that they would even consider cutting trees and, you know, concretifying everything. Right. Um, but so many of the things that you were talking about with Jingu Gaien is things that we saw happen with Hiroshima's Chiyokoi. And then has, we and had, has it already happened or is it in the planning? Already happened. This and is happening this, around Japan, this, actually. Right. This was what we used to have, which was part of the original Peace Park design um, to give the Hiroshima people a place to move forward from the devastation by connecting to nature. And it's one of the only green spaces we had in the city center. Here you can see the castle grounds mm -hmm. and then the Chuo Koen right. and what they what they've made now is all concrete. This is what they're making. And uh, it it was unbelievable to a lot of the Hibakusha um, Hiroshima survivors that they would even consider knocking down some of the trees, which were survivors themselves, or like you said, were donated from around the country. A lot of local people also donated funds and volunteered labor to make that park. So to change it into a private facility that not everybody can go use for picnics or sports or gets togethers, you have to buy a ticket to use that space now. That change from public to private, that really similar to the projects that you're campaigning about. Right? Yes, exactly. And in fact, there are other parks right now that are similarly threatened in Japan. This is happening all over the country. And it's due to a law that was put into place a few years ago called Park PFI. And PFI stands for Private Financing Initiative. So they've taken that a word from English. And it sets up a legal framework by which basically you can um, privatize parks. And when people privatize parks, they want to make money on it. And so they build like concert halls like you just showed or 
um, large sports arenas or they invite universities to use the space and it ends up taking away green space that common people can use and it ends up chopping down trees. And this is happening all over the country. It is an absolutely huge problem. I have never heard of that before I saw you talking about that in your tweet. Um, let's go back to that a little bit later, but let's let's introduce this project that you're still trying to get people to sign the petition yes. by this week, right? right? right. So exactly. tell us tell us about Jingu Gayan. Okay, certainly. So Jingu Gayan has some similarities to what you just said about the park in Hiroshima, that it was built with public contributions both of money and manual labor and contributing trees. And people are probably familiar with Meiji Jingu in Tokyo, which is a major shrine. And right in the, there's an inner garden, which has kind of a huge giant forest. Jingu Gaian, the word Gai is outside. It's the Jingu outside garden. And it's famous for um, this four rows of ginkgo trees, which you are showing right now. There are also um, a variety of sports facilities. So the idea is that the inner garden was a stately, solemn, quiet forest, and that the outer garden would be more a place where people could come and recreate. And so there's um, the Jingu baseball stadium, there's the um, rugby stadium, there is um, a golf practice area. There's a second smaller baseball stadium that high school and college sport, sports teams use. There's a bunch of softball fields. There's a batting dome and there's futsal courts and tennis courts, as well as there's um, three restaurants next to the ginkgo um, trees that are very well loved. And that's kind of a big, you know, kind of um, tourist spot or well-beloved spot by the by the city denizens. So that's that's a view from overhead. So it's right next to the National Stadium, which you can see there's the big white thing at the lower right. And the and so under one of these, you know, basically privatizing a park plan, they are giving part of the park to private interests to build skyscrapers. Um, Itochu Corporation, which already has a tower next to the park, is going to rebuild its tower almost twice as large. They're going to switch the locations of the rugby and the baseball stadium, supersizing both of them, but in the, in the process, which people really um, you know, have, have a lot of um, nostalgia for. If anyone knows Fenway Park or Wrigley Field in the United States as historic baseball stadiums, Jingu um, Stadium is a very similar era and um, people love it. It's, you know, kind of has an old fashioned feel. And for the rugby stadium, rugby fans, they're very, very close to the action in that stadium and, and really enjoy that. Um, and they're planning to make kind of modern boring ones that are very large. And due to kind of making space for all of that, they're going to get rid of all the other facilities that I mentioned, except for the expensive private tennis club. That's going to stay. And they're prioritizing that. But they're getting rid of the golf um, range and the softball fields and the batting dome and the futsal courts. And there's an inside um, ball practice area. So those are all going to go away. So all the things that normal people would use basically are, are not going to be taken away. And in the process, they're going to be cutting down a thousand trees. And the one thing that they keep emphasizing is, oh, but we're not going to touch the four rows of ginkgo trees. However, they're going to site the baseball stadium so close to the ginkgo trees that tree experts have said that it's, it's, you can't help but having them be affected. And it's going to affect how it looks. So that red thing is going to be where there is the back wall of the baseball stadium. It's going to be right next to the ginkgo trees. So it's going to really ruin the quiet atmosphere of that area, both visually and also acoustically, because all the sound from those baseball games is now you're going to be on the ginkgo um, path and hear a baseball game that's really just a few meters away. It's going to ruin the quiet nature of that area. 
and the cafes that are there will be gone. Instead, there's going to be a brick wall of the, um, or whatever wall is made of, of the baseball stadium. Yeah, it's just crazy. And so many similarities with what happened in Hiroshima about the people, all the people losing that public access, losing that public space, and the switch all of a sudden to private and only people who pay right. will be able to access that space. And that's such a social inequity, especially now when so many people are struggling right. so um, many people during are struggling. coronavirus. And also outdoor open spaces are especially important now during a pandemic, right? Because it's a safe place that people can gather and do things. And also people have been cooped up in their houses and being able to get outside is really important. And there's a lot of data out there that parks are, have a really crucial role in mental health. And in a destination appeal for visitors that is true. <laughs> and yes. for new residents to come and live there. We yeah. know that it's really important. Right. Yeah. It's all and it's all been proven. I mean, research has shown all these all these links, right? Yeah. And what are the plans? It's a private tennis court. There's also like a shopping center. Well, yeah, you I'm have kind a... of linking two of the high rise buildings. There's gonna be like this passageway and they publicize yeah, here it is, um, sketches. And I'm telling you, that looks just like a duty-free shopping area um, at an airport. It's just, you know, and some people have been very upset looking at this picture. I mean, that's what they're yeah. thinking of putting there. And trees are going to be sacrificed for that. And, you know, this location is near a bunch of other areas. And, and Tokyo is full of shopping centers. And there's lots of redevelopments where they're putting in more office buildings. So I, you know, as, as the MBA... I have not seen any analysis showing that any of this makes any kind of financial sense for the city or the taxpayers or even for the people who are building it. It really seems motivated by the developers wanting to make money building something. Well, that that connects to Alex Kerr's dogs and demons yes. idea that the idea of concrete developments has been kind of set in stone and that idea that that's what we did before. That's what we have to do for the rest of existence. Right. Well, yeah. it's it's part of, you know, and he talks about it in the book, it's part of this idea that the Japanese um, government and economic system is extremely dependent on spending money to build things. And they've already paved over almost everything that could be paved over in the country. And now parks are looking like a very... Um, attractive target for um, developers who want to build things. And so either it's open space where they can build something new, or they use this word in Japanese, roku ka, which means like outdated and decrepit. And so they just slap that on everything. Oh, it's a few years old. It's old and decrepit. We have to rebuild it. And so there's no talk about, you know, retrofitting or renovating, or any less expensive and more environmentally friendly option. And in the case of Jingu Gaian, you know, preserving the historical structures that are there that a lot of people love. One person I, I know um, heard that I was doing this and is uh, someone I had worked with in a business context a few years ago and had been out of touch and she sent me an email and she said, I sold peanuts and popcorn at Jingu Gaian all through high school and college and I'm a huge Swallows fan. And I heard about this redevelopment and it was like a stake through my heart. And that's how strongly people feel about these facilities. And that's just being ignored. And yeah, that, that connection to nature that so many of us have from childhood, from uh, getting out on a stressful day at work and getting out and seeing trees, even as you walk around the neighborhood, right. we all know it's so important, you know? And then you made the connection as well that Tokyo has big environmental targets that they're supposed to be aiming towards. Right. How does this fit in it doesn't to the cutting it, a thousand trees? <laughs> I mean, you can't justify cutting down a thousand trees and building large structures that are gonna take lots of CO2 to build and maintain, there's no way you can justify that environmentally. 
Now you've been on NHK, you've been on uh, other interview shows. Um, how has how has that gone? Has that helped to raise awareness? Has that gotten more people to sign the campaign? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I actually, there was a show on NHK last week and I personally was not on it. I saw actually a glimpse of myself in a crowd shot, but they didn't interview me, but they interviewed, um, there's a lot of Japanese um, activists working on this as well. And so we're kind of, um, you know, like the Momotaro diverse team, you know, with different people doing different things. And we've got, you know, the head of an architecture journal and we all have got all sorts of people working on this. It's not just me. Um, you know, I'm, but I'm doing my part, doing what I'm good at, and I know how to do petitions, and I know how to do social media, um, and I know how to speak out. So actually, the thing that got a lot of attention is there was an article in um, Smart Flash, which is a Japanese online publication that um, it's a little bit sensational. And they had an article, and the content of the article was really excellent. It was an interview with me, but they um popped a really eye-popping title on it it said american entrepreneur um declares war on governor koike <laughs> and so that got a lot of people's attention including a lot of people who don't like governor koike for other reasons but it just it grabbed a lot of eyeballs and it got picked up in a whole different kind of group of of readers and netizens that other other than who we reached before and that um that bumped up in a couple of days we added twenty thousand people to our to our petition so that's when i was delivering the petition the first time um i delivered it and did a press conference um in march hoping to stop koike from ratifying the project um and unfortunately she went ahead anyways and so I'm going to be doing the same thing again. You see, it's a really big deal. It has the number of people who've signed. It becomes very prominent and it goes in the headline. So I'm trying to get as many people as I can um, ready for this um, next one that I'm doing on Thursday morning. And so I'm doing another, um, it's called a Yobo show, which like it's like a request letter, or I guess you'd call it demand letter, um, on behalf of the petitioners. And this time I'm doing not just Tokyo's government, but I'm also going to be going to Meiji Jingu, which is the owner of the property in the area um, that's being developed. Um, Mitsui Fudo-san, which is developer, Itochu, which is in on the whole thing, and also the Japan Sports Promotion Center. Um, is involved in well as well. So I'm going to be um, sort of um, giving them all a little bit of pressure. Yeah, I see. I'm linking and sharing the link again on the chat right now. Thank you. Um, it looks like you have 80,315 right. signatures. That's wonderful. Are you hoping to get 150,000 by this week? Oh, boy. And well, I think it's going to be hard because you know, it's Thursday is when I'm turning it in. I'd like to get over a hundred, but that means we'd have to have another huge rush like I did last week. So we'll see. So everyone, if everyone who's watching this signs and tells 10 people, then maybe we can do it. So. Yeah, you never know. And the biggest point, you think the, the biggest hook has been the thousand trees. I mean, a thousand trees, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot and a trees. lot of these trees are also more than a hundred years old, right, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of hundred year old trees. There's a lot of trees that were donated from around Japan and also around the world. So there's a variety of them. There's some huge and beautiful trees that are in there. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different problems. You know, the trees, a thousand trees is obviously eye catching. The fact that they're going to take away so many facilities that common people use is also really upsetting. There's the issue of why are we putting a high rise and a shopping mall on public land? Why is that in the public interest? And there's also the problem of the whole way that they have gone about this project, which has been with as little as possible um, information disclosure and not involving the public. So what I'm going to be saying in my letter um, to the to the governor this week on behalf of the petitioners is they really have to go back to square one on this and start out with a better process. You know, there's lots of different stakeholders here and 
most of the stakeholders have been completely left out of this process. And it's just been the developer kind of pushing ahead, you know, we're going to build something. And that doesn't meet the interests of the Tokyo citizens and the Tokyo taxpayers. It doesn't meet the interests of the environment. And so they need to, they need to go back to square one. And I think going forward, um, oh, I'll, I'll post again. Paul is asking mm -hmm. for the petition again. Um, I'll post it right now, actually. Thank you for asking, Paul. And if you have, I have a, you gave you a QR code. If you have that, you could share it too. Um, yeah, I don't know how QR codes work on this, this program, but, but we I could try it. I it as a picture and I think it should work for people if they hold their phone oh, up okay. Yeah, give it a try. Yeah, if, if you have it, uh, yeah, I don't know how we do that live, but, um, we'll, we'll put it in the link well, anyway there's a link okay. so people just, should be able to get that it's just a it's just a picture you could show it like you're showing the other pictures uh i but i don't have it uploaded oh i see okay okay sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah um so yeah the that social inequity as well as the environmental impact right. i think in terms of sustainability we're talking about um, profits, people, and planet in balance yep. is the aim, right? right? right. Exactly. And so even for the corporate interests who are there, I don't know why they don't realize that this is really negative branding for them it is to be totally a part negative of as well. Branding. People have been, well, including myself, been dragging Mitsui Fudosan through the coals on social media. And, you know, part of what I'm going to say in my letter, both to um, Governor Koike and also to Mitsui Fudosan is, do you want to be known as the mayor or the company that destroyed Jingu Gaian? Or do you want to be known for having gone through a much better sustainable process that's in keeping with, you know, the 21st century, right? And you know, this is just a stark choice that they have. And you know, now, you know, in, in my in my work life, I'm an ex external board member and and you know, in the in the whole corporate governance world, there's a big emphasis now on ESG, the environmental, social, and governance aspects. And so that's very related to what you just talked about. You know, there's the environmental, social, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, again, the social equity. And so from an ESG standpoint, you know, right now all companies like want to talk about their ESG credentials. How can Mitsui Fudosan say that they're an ESG play as, as, a, as a company when they're doing something like this? It's really, it's, it's inconsistent. And it's unwise on their part. You know, long ago in my past, I was the English language, you know, international PR person for a large Japanese bank. That's what, what, the beginning of my career. So I know a little bit about PR for Japanese companies and, and doing something like this is not good PR practice. Let's just put it that way. Any anyone who remembers the movie Gung Ho, do you remember that? Oh, yes. <laughs> the American, so it's a Japanese company, car company, of course, that goes to America and they try to do a Japanese way, but then they learn how to compromise and try to do what's right for the local people to be a good ethical company. Right. That's what we need to, you know, the corporate mindset to be thinking they're not only playing to customers in Japan, doing this kind of negative branding affects their brand internationally. Mm -hmm. It affects Tokyo as a destination internationally. Right. So it's, it's much bigger than just Japan, I think. Yeah. I saw that you in Fukuoka, you were taking part in cleanup activities. Oh, yes. Just beach cleanup. Yeah. A little bit. Yes. And uh, I'm going to join them in Fukuoka this coming weekend, the Fukuoka for Sustainability right, Group. Right. Oh, they're a wonderful group. Yes. Yeah. But you've also in Tokyo, you've been out in a kayak. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this cleanup. weekend I did kayak river cleaning, which was really fun, actually. <laughs> so yeah, combined, I've, I've been a kayaker for years. And so this combined two things I like to do, pick up garbage and kayak. And it was actually, it was like a game because your, your kayaks kind of bobbing around and particularly they used inflatable ones. So they were particularly kind of bobbing. 
and they're bobbing on the current. And then you've got these pieces of plastic that are floating away. And so you're trying to like grab something, but you can't lean over too much or you're going to tip your boat. So it was like a giant treasure hunt. It was or a, like a video game, but live, you know, where you're trying to do something. It was actually extremely fun. But it was also fun to just get out there on the river. But it was it was just trying to pick up the garbage was actually more fun than I expected. Yeah, uh, we we try to get out at least once a month and do even a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I find that even even though I'm always thinking and talking about sustainability, getting out and actually picking it up from the river makes me more oh, makes you like much passionate more aware. about much not aware. buying it, right? Yeah, no, it makes Is that much more same aware. for you? Yeah, I had never done anything like that until I did the beach cleans in Fukuoka, and they were really eye opening because when you see with your own eyes what's there. It just makes you much more sensitized. And you really see everything, don't you? Like you see the little plastic straws on the juice boxes. You see all of the wrappings that you right. see in the supermarkets. Right. Like you see absolutely everything. And it's really shocking, isn't it? It is really shocking. So yeah, it's great for awareness. I definitely recommend for everyone. You know, in, in Tokyo, at least, there's the there's Tokyo River Friends that they take groups out to a couple of the different rivers. Um, there's some beach cleanups. And um, so there's definitely different possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. I know that um, Alana Bonzi in Fujisawa, she does the beach cleanups regularly there mm -hmm. and art projects from the ocean plastics. And uh, like you mentioned, uh, River Friends, mm -hmm. are they? In yeah, Tokyo? Tokyo River Friends, yes. Tokyo River Friends, Echo Local is another uh, group that's doing regular riverside cleanups in Tokyo. Um, I think we all we all should do it at least once in a while because even even if you just go out and do it on your own, I think it's really informative. Right, right, right exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so getting back to the campaign a little bit, Rochelle. Um, what do you hope will happen? So you're doing the online campaign for signatures. You've also been going and protesting around the area. Is that right? Well, that was actually what you're showing a picture of. It wasn't so much a protest. It was more, um, there's a group that I've been coordinating with, a Japanese group. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's um, uh, Jingu Gaia no Momoru Yushi Netto. And they have been having just like tours of Jingu Gaia and, showing people, okay, here is what's going to be built where. And they have, there's a Japanese architect and she um, shares that um, information with everyone um, as, the, as the kind of the tour, the tour, um, tour guide. And so they've been leading groups and so that was a picture of them. Um, and we'll probably be scheduling some more. What we're really hoping is that um, either Koike or Mitsui Fudao-san are both working together, say, or, or Jin Gugayan, that someone says, hey, look, let's just stop here and go back. We're going to withdraw the current plan. So that's what we're trying to pressure them to do. Because Koike kept saying things like, oh, well, we're going to save as many trees possible, and every tree is important. And like, well, you can't save any trees if you don't change the plan of what you're building. Because if you're planning to put a building here, then all the trees that are there have to go away. I mean, it's not like you can really save them. So we really need to pressure them to just go back to square one and realize that the public is not going to accept having something like this forced down our throats. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned about they have said they will be transplanting trees. But that's another problem. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Certainly. So they um, that's one thing that the city says is, oh, we're going to plant transplant trees. However, if you um, look at the trees that were transplanted when the national stadium was built, they're not in very good shape. And so here's one of them that's completely dead. And so if you go there, then they're actually the Tokyo Shinbun had a tree expert and they took him on a tour around the new national stadium and he pointed out all the problems with the trees a lot of them are dying their their leaves are yellow when the the ones that are healthy across the street are green um, it's not easy to pl transplant a tree as that tree expert said 
it's like major surgery on a human, what you have to do to a tree when you move it. And there's no guarantee that they're going to survive or thrive, especially when you have these huge older trees. They're very, very difficult to move. I, I agree. And it's, it's, you know, we know so much more about how trees grow and communicate. And there's a lot of books that talk about the mother tree, that there are certain, especially old growth trees that support all the trees around it. So it's, it's not as easy as just moving it to a new location. Right, right. right exactly. It's, it's, it's a whole ecosystem that's developed there, right? Which you disturb. Yeah. And the, the line of ginkgo trees, which is so popular, it actually is along a road, but it, it looks like it has become like a picnic spot. Everybody goes and sees all the trees and takes walks there, yeah. especially in autumn. Right. But it provides so much shade and comfort for people, right. especially in the city when you, you feel really stressed being around so much concrete. Right. right? And there's, and there's um, um, benches along it. And um, it, 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 you know, regular intervals and people hang out there and, and, and are comfortable. And there's also cafes that are underneath the, the branches of the ginkgo, ginkgo trees, which have wonderful atmosphere. And I think it's, I, I personally think it's one of the, the nicest spots in Tokyo. And they're thinking of just, you know, demolishing them and putting the wall of a baseball stadium there. It's just, you know, it makes me think of the Japanese word motai nai, you know, what a waste. And you know the irony is, is this project? It's it, they use this Japanese word machi zukuri, which is you know creating a city or creating a town space or creating an urban area. And what's the point of a machi zukuri plan if you're taking away the machi that's already there that people love? Now you you've worked in Japanese businesses and American businesses for a long time. And I, I also have lived and worked here for a long time. I, I really feel that if they can find the right reason to do the right thing, change can happen really fast sure. and very effectively in this country. That's true. Um, do you get a sense of what, what is stopping them from doing the right thing right now? You know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I, I have kind of two theories. I think one is there's the whole thing that, again, that Alex Kerr talks about in Dogs and Demons, that Japanese organizations get locked into plans and it's very, very hard to change them. And so that's one thing that's happening here. You know, the plan takes on a life of its own. It's very difficult to stop. The second thing is, is that there are a lot of entrenched interests behind this that, um, uh, Yoshiro Mori from the guy you remember, everyone remembers from the Olympics, you know, the former prime minister, gaff prone guy, he's big into rugby and sports. And actually the idea of developing Jingu Gaian was his brainchild. And so anyone who wants to stop this plan is going to have Mr. Mori and his supporters not be happy. And I think that, that must be a political liability for some people. And the other thing is, is that Mitsui Fudosan and other people involved stand to make a huge amount of money from this project. And they're not going to give that up easily. Right. Well, let's hope the, the money they uh, potentially will lose from negative branding starts to dawn on them. Um, there were a so. few points. Yeah, there were a few points that you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting. And I hadn't heard about this. You said there might also be financial concerns of the Meiji Shrine yes. as one of the reasons? Yes, um, that was reported by the Tokyo Shinbun recently, that evidently, it's the, you can think of it that Tokyo has kind of been freeloading off of Meiji Jingu for having this public space that's almost like a public park, but really it's all fallen on Meiji Jingu to, to, um, to, to run it. And so um, Meiji Jingu, you know, they make money from the stadium and they make money from, you know, the other facilities that are there that people pay for. And, you know, they make money from the um, rent from those restaurants. But evidently Meiji Jingu is in financial straits and it's burdensome to keep up this whole area. And so 
they've kind of basically like you know i i can you say soldier souls of the devil with with shinto i don't know if there's really an equivalent but that's kind of what it's like is that they're like oh well you know we, we we're gonna you know agree to this whole plan because that's how they see a way to make more money and to solve their financial problems now again as an mba why is it that they're going with this plan and surely that there are other possibilities and in fact a lot of people's um reaction has been you know when they made this bark in the first place it was people who were involved contributing money labor and trees and people are very upset about this park maybe being changed so why couldn't they do crowdfunding why couldn't we find a new way to try and support meiji jingu rather than them having to sell their souls to, souls to the devil that is really it just blows your mind doesn't it because a lot of the core principles of shinto is its connection to nature right right and so to even though you are struggling financially your point about doing crowdfunding asking the community to help makes so much more sense than just selling to a company right right exactly yes there, wow, there ought to be another way to do it that you're right that's more consistent with shinto values yeah but i have heard that a lot of the big shrines and temples in kyoto are also suffering um, there have been a lot less people using their services during coronavirus. So there might be a, a lot of things about the pandemic which have really negatively impacted mm. their finances. Yeah, no, right? that's a good point, too. Although I think there are pro the major Jingu's problems predated the pandemic, but you're right, that might have made them worse. Yeah. Um, anyway, we would love to know more and how the community can support them and Hopefully them coming on the side of saving the trees would also help get more people inspired to go and support them. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, another thing you mentioned was the Olympic planning um, loosened height restrictions right. on buildings. Yes. Which may have been a contributing factor. Oh, definitely Can you talk a about contributing that? factor, yes. And this all, again, seems to have been part of Mr. Mori's plotting. And in fact, there are some people who say that inviting the Olympics to Japan was a pretext for developing Jingu Gaian. That that, you know, Jingu, developing Jingu Gaian was such a juicy prize that, you know, the Olympics were just an excuse for it. So the um, Jingu Gaian in 1926 was designated as Japan's first protected landscape area. And it had height restrictions. And those were taken away in the Olympics, uh, well, for the Olympics. And that made it possible to build the new national stadium, which is taller than the old one was. But they, they removed it conveniently for the whole area, which makes it possible now to do these high rises. Very fishy. Oh my God. Very fishy. That is crazy. Is this private financing initiative, is that connected to the Olympic loosening of no, restrictions? No, 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 that's different, yeah. That's just the vehicle that they're using to make it possible to give part of the park or part of the land to um, to the um, developers or to private use. Wow. So this um, private financing initiative, is it the governments who are selling the la public land to the private company? Right, exactly. That's how it works. And so the the P park PFI law creates the framework by which this can be done. And so again, we're seeing it happen all over the country. Um, in, in Nagoya, I forgot the name of the park, but someone was mentioning on Twitter, there was one where they just, um, you know, it's now all luxury boutiques and restaurants. Um, Miyashita Park in Shibuya, which became, went from being a park to being a whole giant thing which they put a little greenery on the top and said it's still a park. Um, there are smaller parks in Tokyo that people are talking about. You know, they're, they're taking out playground equivalent and they're putting in cafes. Um, there's a park out near Tsukuba where they're putting in a glamping um, facility. And again, um, to, taking down lots of trees to make a parking lot for it. Um, there's a park in Kobe where they're inviting a university. There's Kyoto Botanical Garden 
where they're again in, may, creating a, a 10,000 person arena for a really tiny college that's there that doesn't even need it. Um, and, and again, sacrificing lots of the park. So the, there's um, one, there's issues with these all over. There's Seiya in um, Yokohama, which is a former um, US military facility that was turn, returned to the Japanese government. And there's this beautiful lush area and they just want to pave it over, ironically, to make a flower ex exhibition. It just, it's so counterintuitive. It doesn't, it doesn't follow the 2030 targets. It doesn't follow any kind of rationale. No. We have, we have so many areas, even just outside the city center where we have urban sprawl where we have a lot of derelict old buildings, why not redevelop those areas? Why not keep the little bit of green that we have? Right. And every, it seems like the, the idea is to turn everything into concrete. Well, yeah, well, that's what the developers are like because that's what they make money on. And for developers, they love working with municipal governments because municipal governments in Japan have a lot of money. And frankly, they're not always particularly sophisticated in how they use their money. And so they're, they're kind of, they're great marks, as I guess you could say. And then also these green spaces are very convenient because if you were trying to like get a whole bunch of derelict buildings in the suburbs, that's a pain to deal with, but you've got this whole space that's right there. It's very easy, right? It's just so pernicious. It's very disturbing. The more I learn about it, the more upset I am. Yeah, it's really upsetting. And in Hiroshima, when they uh, dug into the Central Park, they actually found a lot of the old castle and military ruins mm -hmm. and graves. Mm -hmm. So they had to very carefully and very expensively move those graves somewhere else before they put the soccer stadium. Uh -huh. um, and that was really upsetting to a lot of survivors of as well. Of that course. that should not, you should not be disturbing graves, yeah. right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, for, yeah it, for a stadium, right? And so, so again, th this, um, this idea, oh, we're going to improve our, our economy by having a stadium. You know, it's like, did you ever play that? There was that game, with um, where you made a simulated city and then you would make a stadium and see if you made money or whatever. It's kind of like that. Like, I want to have all the Japanese politicians play that game and see how building a stadium actually works or not, right? Well, it's it's just like the Dr. Seuss book, the Lorax, right? <laughs> You're destroying all of your nature for progress. And when you have everything that you wanted, which is basically money, you're going to have a horrible life because you're lacking nature, which is something you need for a high quality life and right. existence. Exactly. And we, we should have all learned this as children before we become right. responsible adults making these decisions. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, we have some great comments from Paul Betty on uh, LinkedIn. Thanks, Paul. He says, a campaign to the board members of Mitsui, Fudosan, and Itochu would be impactful. Also letting the folks at EO Business know e and write about it. Or maybe is they eco businesses? Is that what you maybe eco businesses? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, everyone um in addition to writing on the petition, um, you know, contact your politicians as well if you're someone who lives in Tokyo. And it's likely this is going to become a national issue in the next election as well. But, you know, send in, yeah. send in your own, own notes as well. Yeah. And I would also uh, recommend not only signing up for these petitions and, and campaigns when they're under development, but do it before these plans get there. Uh, tell your politicians and policymakers and business people and just tell everybody and put it on social media how much you love and appreciate these natural areas 
And please don't do anything to take them away because I, it feels like all of them are at risk right now. Yeah, no, they really are. I mean, I, and so look into what is going on with the areas near you and make sure there's not any plans like this, you know, and try and prevent them. You're right. As soon as you can. Yeah. I think uh, for the people in Hiroshima, we, we felt this plan went through way too fast mm. and nobody had a chance even to do a campaign or to protest at all. It just seemed to go right through to development without anybody realizing. Yeah, that's what they tried to and, do with this one. Unfortunately, we were able to, you know, start making noise. But yeah, you got to be on top of it, right? Yeah. So I, I'm so glad that you have a great group there, and you guys are all trying to get the information out and uh, staying in the public view. I think that's really important. Um, do you have any other interviews or anything coming up to talk about it? Um, on Wednesday evening, I'm going to be on News Op-Ed, which is an internet TV you know, type news program. It's a nightly thing. So um, in Katakana, News Op-Ed um, is, is, and I'm going to be putting up an a update to the petition today and it'll have a link in there as well. So that's going to be in Japanese. Um, I was supposed to be on another Japanese um, internet news program this evening that suddenly got canceled. Um, frankly, it's a little bit suspicious, but um, so, so that so we're not doing that one. But I've got one on Wednesday. How about any other newspapers? Um, you were like these ones that covered your petition. Um, was that the newspaper? Yes, exactly. So that's that's from NHK right there. And um, I'm going to be doing another press conference on Thursday. So look again on Friday or Thursday night for more like these, right? So yeah, great. And this one as well, was that also NHK? What, um, you know, that was another another TV show. And so that was, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a Sunday afternoon weekend show that they do where they um, kind of go to places where the news is happening. And so I'm standing there in front of a couple of the trees that are slated to be chopped down. Wow. And coming from Silicon Valley, now California is really struggling with drought, uh, not having enough trees, having too much concrete. Right. Is there any lessons from California that we should apply in Japan, you think? Well, I think, you know, maybe not only just from California, but in general, you know, Japan, one of the things that makes it so lovely is it's so green and the beautiful trees. And so that's a great natural resource that Japan has that really it needs to be valuing more. Yeah. Uh, whenever I do walking tours uh, with people around the world, they always comment on the beautiful trees. Mm -hmm. And I always brag about the amazing trees we have mm -hmm. and how everybody in Japan comes out and enjoys the trees in spring, right, exactly. in autumn, right. all throughout the year. And I really think that's true. Yeah. Um, the people do really appreciate it, the people who live here. Right. So we need to just get that through to the people making the decisions, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, I think, I feel like in Japan, trees are taken for granted. And they aren't, you know, they're valued, but I think they're not, you know, they're, it's not codified in law to, that they need to be protected. So and at some point, I want to, I want to be continuing my activism on this. And I'd love to see Japan have laws that protect trees like like exist in other places so for example where i live in silicon valley if you are building like a new addition to your house and you want to cut down trees to make room for it you have to go through a planning process with the county or the city where, where, where depending on where you live in order to get approval for that you can't you know, um you can't chop down trees without permission and in japan if it's on your private property you can do whatever you want with a tree and so that's an area of potential improvement in Japan, I think. Yeah. And another um, part of the planning process that could help is whenever you're developing a new project, you have to have 10% of the property with grass and trees or something like that in the planning stage. And that would also really help, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Rochelle. Thanks for sharing your insights and your passion. For these projects, these are so important. I wish you had been in Hiroshima 
uh, when we were going through it. But hopefully, hopefully you can help save these amazing trees and uh, stop this development from destroying that area. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to do my best. And thanks, everyone, for your support. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you again next time. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you.